privilege to speak at a commencement. It's, I love to do weddings. I don't know that they always love me to do weddings, but I love to do weddings. I love to do baptisms or christenings. I, I, I love to do funerals. They're life-changing events for everyone that's there, right? Your life will never be the same after you get married. Your life will never be the same after you've had a baby. Your life will never be the same when someone close to you dies. And so there's life before and there's life after, and it's the same with the commencement. It's the same with our education. There's before and there's after. It's a life-changing moment that needs to be noted and needs to be thought about and savored and remembered. And so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take four or five themes tonight. I am going to stay within my time. But I want to tell you ahead of time so you'll know how far along I am. I'm going to talk about the, the graduation and assessment or measurement. The graduation and finishing. The graduation and the letters or the degree. The graduation and the witness or testimony and the graduation and the sending. We talk a lot in our mission and in the body of Christ today about transformation, reformation. We talk about discipleship. We talk about having our minds transformed so that we think like Christ. And what we are talking about when we talk about those things is breathing life back into what death has begun to creep into. Reforming, renewing our minds is to breathe the life of God back into those things that are, that are nearly dead. And we do this not gigantic leap by gigantic leap, but moment by moment. Literally. We, we demonstrate the size of our God by how many moments of our life and our day we will allow him to take and tell us what he thinks about them. What he wants to do in them, how he's viewing them and how he's using them. So no matter what the moment is, it might be changing a diaper. It might be cleaning toilets, a favorite YWAM job for many of us. <laughs> well, it was favored for us, not necessarily our favorite. It, it could be driving down the road, but, but we build the kingdom of God within ourselves moment by moment and taking each moment and saying, and what are you doing here, God? And I had somebody say to me, that sounds exhausting. <laughs> and it is when you don't know God very well. But the better you know God, the more natural it is just to be in that ongoing dialogue. It's no effort at all. And so the moment that we want to capture now is this graduation, this commencement. We are here whether we like it or not. <laughs> we might as well ask God if there's something he wants to make out of it. Something he wants us here for. Something he wants us to leave with that we didn't come with. And I'm speaking specifically to the graduates. But we are all on an educational journey in the kingdom of God. So this has application to all of us. The first thing we struggle to reform, we struggle to see from God's perspective, is the process of assessment and measuring and grading. We hate it in general. We think, oh, what is this for? You know, like it's a number, it's a letter, it's a, it's a set of numbers that equal some final number that means what. And, and we have really allowed death to creep into the whole concept of assessment and measurement 
when every child under the school age of school loves it. If you have a child that hasn't gone to school yet, you know they're, they want it, their height marked on the door. They want you to lift them and say, I'm bigger, Ernie, I'm bigger. They, they want to say, look at me, I'm going to jump. Did I jump higher? Did I jump farther? Did I jump more than they jumped? And they don't, they don't see this as an identity crisis. <laughs> They, they don't think of it like that. They think of it as a process of growth, and they're eager to grow, and they're eager to get bigger and stronger and leap farther, and, and they're eager to be told, honey, you're not very good at that. You should work on this. You're very good over here. See, that's just a fact. Okay, I'll work on this. I'm very good at this. <laughs> wow, how far we've come. Because by the time we've gone to school for a little while, we think it's a measurement of myself. I failed. I didn't measure up. I didn't get the top number. My cumulative was not where I wanted it to be. What's that mean about me? Not much. <laughs> it tells you where you are strong and where you're weak where you are grown, and where you need to grow more. <laughs> Isn't that a great thing? Isn't that what we want? No, not since I was five. Well, it needs to be, to be redeemed. It needs to be reformed. We need to get past this because God loves assessment and measurement. He loves it. He does it within his own Godhead. My son in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> Have you noticed all the things God measures in scripture? You, you, Howard Momstad, who was the founding provost of our university, wanted me to put mathematics in the communication college, which I struggled with having failed math all of my life. <laughs> because it's a language. And that is true, but I found it too abstract, and so I got him to put it in another college. But in, but in fact, numbers is the language of the universe. Measurement is built in to the quantitative and qualitative reality of the world. Measurement is God's way of giving us reality. Somebody, a lot of people say to me, oh, you're only as old as you feel. No, you're not. <laughs> you may not feel old, you may not feel young, but you are as old as you are. And that's 365 days, and how many times that rotation went around. You see, we live in a real world. We're real people. We have, we have real skills. We have real strengths. We have real weaknesses. We have real laws that function. Imagine if you got up every morning not knowing if gravity was there. <laughs> so you couldn't function. And imagine if you were completely devoid of knowing anything about yourself because there was no way to measure yourself against anything else. You wouldn't exist. You see that? And so God loves assessment. It is good, he says. Uh, we're still working on that. <laughs> It's not good for Adam to be alone. Little more work here. He is assessing. He is qualifying. He is measuring. Without this, we would not know who we are and what we are capable of doing. We would not know our strengths. We would not know our weaknesses. We would not know what needs to be worked on. We would not know what is not working on because you're never going to get there. <laughs> Do you know how liberating that is? 
for a dyslectic that's 67 years old to know that spelling is never, ever, ever going to be my thing. <laughs> that I can just misspell before the world and go, sorry, if you passed that, just correct it in your own notes. How liberating. But I have other things I can do. Amen. And I have other weaknesses. This is who I am. This is the reality of who you are. So I want you as graduates to embrace those things in your degrees programs that you failed or that you didn't get as high a mark as you wanted, or that you struggled with because you actually didn't get it at all. <laughs> Embrace it. This is not an evaluation of who you are. This is an evaluation of where your weaknesses are and where your strengths are. Use that knowledge as you go into the future. Embrace your failures, embrace your strengths. A humble person does both. I do this really well is not a proud statement. And I do this really poorly. Can be proud. Because if you don't do it poorly, it's not true. Therefore, it is pride, not humility. And if you don't do it well, it's not true. Therefore, it's pride rather than humility. But to say, I do this well, use me here. I'll do this for you, but I'm really bad at it, is a humble person. <laughs> Jesus loves humility. The second thing we want to talk about is finishing. Finishing is so underrated. Finishing is basic to the kingdom of God. We are not just called to do, we're called to finish. And one of the astounding things in the life of Jesus is at the end of his life, he could say, Father, I have finished at 33 what you gave me to do. That meant he knew what he was to do because everything wasn't done. Finishing is, is part of what it means to be like God. Animals never finish. <laughs> they die, but they don't finish. There's no concept of it. Finishing is part of creativity. I had an idea. I had a commitment. I stepped out into it, and I <laughs> finished it. And so at creation, God says at the end of day one, that's finished. Moving on. When Jesus is in the garden, he says, Father, I have finished. On the cross, he says, Father, it is finished. Not his work, but the transition of reality his death is going to bring into creation. We need to finish so that we can move on. We need to finish so there is something new. And finishing is a transition point. OK? Now. That's in the last part. For the rest of your life, when you fill out forms, you will be asked on that form, what level of education did you finish? <laughs> <laughs> you can now write something new. <laughs> and why is this question on every form? Because it is important. It doesn't tell anyone everything about you, but it tells everyone something about you. And that something is important. And it will follow you the rest of your life. <laughs> We trust people who have finished more than people who never finish. It is a sign of character development. It tells us something about perseverance. It tells us something about skill levels. It tells us something about who the person is and what is behind their words when they put their word on it. 
It doesn't tell us everything, but finishing isn't nothing. That might be incorrect grammar, so excuse me. Letters. The concept of letters and degrees and diplomas has been so infiltrated by death. It's so sad. Uh, you hear people say, ah, it's just a piece of paper. You know, ah, it's just an AA, a BA, a MA, a PhD, do da, do da, do da. Who cares? <laughs> well, God cares. And letters begin, really, in the early church. And they're literally letters that were written by elders and apostles about young men and women of God who were beginning to move out in ministry. And these letters said, please receive so-and-so. I commend them in Christ for this, this, and this. And some of the letters said, please do not receive so-and-so because he never finished. See, they weren't all puffed up letters. They were letters that conveyed something true and real about the skill, about the maturity, and the character and abilities of the individual they were representing. And you carried them with you. And when you went to a new church, you gave it to the leadership of that church, and they read it and said, welcome, based on the endorsement of those who knew you. And so that is the history or the background of these letters that we receive now that are literally letters, or these degrees, or these pieces of paper. They say you are trustworthy in a category of skill and maturity you didn't have before you finished. Love believes all things does not mean love believes everything. We should not believe everything everybody says about themselves. Because the fact is, people lie, even Christians on occasion. <laughs> and if they're not outright lying, they will embellish. Commendations and endorsements and letters are part of how God protects us from those that would falsify who they really are. We should welcome that assessment. We should welcome that commendation, the need for that endorsement. We should not think that we can stand alone and present ourselves and be known for who we are without any other witness. That would be proud. And so embrace your diplomas. Embrace your degrees, not just as some little hoop you had to jump through because that's what the provost requires, but as a real accomplishment that is noted on paper, but more importantly, noted in heaven. Your degree is an endorsement of you. It is an endorsement of your level of maturity. It is an endorsement of your skill level. And it is an endorsement of a level of character and perseverance that you can honorably embrace and say, yes, I was able to do this. Thank you, God. You know, we are asked all over the wine wine world to write ref references. And really, this is part of the world we live in, no matter what our vocation is. And those references are one of the most important things we ever do as leaders. There is a, there is a tendency to deal with that lightly, whether it's in schools or when you get student uh, you know, um, endorsement papers to fill out for somebody or it's a staff member moving from place to place. You see, when we fill out that endorsement, we either lie or tell the truth. And so many think, oh, well, I could never tell the truth because that would be judgmental. No, that would be honest. Yes. Judgmentalness is when you say there's no hope. See, so if you have someone who is stolen and, and, and you've worked it out at the base and they want to go to a new base and, and they are repentant or moving on and they say, do they have any weaknesses? You want to say, yes, they had to deal with stealing. 
but they are walking in repentance and we believe they are ready to work in a new place, but they will need for you to know their weakness. Yeah. How protecting, how wonderful hope that we can work in our weaknesses. We don't have to be hidden. We can be seen and we can continue to grow. This is what your degrees do in an area of your life. The last thing, or the next to the last thing I want to talk about is witnesses. God loves witnesses. Witnesses, oh boy, I wish I had enough life in me to write a book about witnesses. Because they are so important from the very beginning of scripture all the way to Revelation. And those, what is it, seven witnesses? Times of our lives that are life-changing need to be witnessed. Why? Because they are important. Because they are not just about us as an individual, they're about us as a community, as a family, as a body. Witnesses come alongside of what you have done and agree. And that agreement is part of what brings the authority of God in and through you. It isn't just that you have done it, just that you have the skill, just that you know what you're called to do. It is also that witnesses have come alongside of you and there is agreement. And the more witnesses, the better. And so it is important to have an event where we invite people to witness what we are doing or what we have done and to agree with that. And to think that we don't need it is to misunderstand the kingdom altogether. It's to misunderstand the, the bridesmaids that wait with their oil lamps for the groom to come. Okay, and the last thing is sending. We need to be sent from what we have accomplished to what is next. The sending is not the calling. The calling comes from God, and you may or may not know what your next, I mean, your next thing may be finishing what you've started, <laughs> and that's okay. We can do this ahead of time, but you still need to finish. But it, the, calling, the calling doesn't come from us standing with you and sending you. The calling comes from God, and you may not know what it is, or you may, but when we stand and send you, we are sending you into that which God knows is next. And there is always a next, and the next is always as scary as the last. And we need others to stand with us and say, yes, we agree with God in this. And so we agree on earth with what God is in, has done in heaven. And we witness tonight a special finishing and turning point in your life. Thank you.